is October 28, 2021. I'm with the Indiana Jewish Historical Society. My name is Emma Maggart, M-A-G-G-A-R-T, and I am here with Harry Morrison, M-O-R-R-I-S-O-N. All right, um, so thank you for being here today. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just gonna start with, um, can you tell me a little bit about where you're from? I believe it's uh, New York, and just mm-hmm. some about your experience there. Well, I grew up uh, in Brooklyn, uh, in Borough Park, which is, was and probably still is a very Jewish part of Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Um, by the time I left, it was becoming fairly orthodox. A lot of Hasidic Jews moved in, uh, but I spent my life before college uh, living in Borough Park. Mm-hmm. Um, in New York, many Jews uh, who came over from Europe, as my grandparents did, um, started out in Williamsburg, uh, which now is a fairly, I think, up, upscale area. But in the time that I lived there, or they lived there, Williamsburg was uh, a place where immigrants started out. And then Borough Park was sort of the next step in in their migration to better neighborhoods. And uh, typically in my day, the next step from there was to Queens. And then if you really made it big, you moved out to Long Island, which mm-hmm. in the Jewish vernacular is Long Island. Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, so I grew up in, in Brooklyn. Um, I went to a magnet school uh, called Stuyvesant High School, which was in Manhattan. Okay. Uh, had to take an exam, that kind of thing. At the time I went, it was all boys, as was Bronx High School of Science, another magnet school, became co-ed later on. Um, graduated college at a very early age. I had just turned 16 uh, and went to Brandeis University. So the question was, do you want to continue from there or do you want more from my early childhood? <laughs> um, can you tell me what country your uh, parents were from in Europe? My parents were born here. Okay. Um, my grandparents were from Hungary. At the time, I believe Transylvania, which is between Hungary and Romania, I believe. And I think my grandmother must have been from the same area. Okay. Um, I don't know where, that's my father's side. My grand, my mother's parents, I would guess also Romania is where I think they, they came from. So that part of the world? Yeah, um, Eastern European. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, can you tell me a little bit about your early childhood? Um, was your family observant? What? Kind of community uh, no, in? we were not an observant community. Uh, my my parents were active in the temple. Um, you would say we were high holiday Jews. Okay. Uh, uh, we went. It was a conservative temple, fairly large one, uh, not far from where we lived, probably uh, fifteen blocks away. Uh, um, maybe not even that much. Um, we were always well aware of our Judaism. We celebrated the Jewish holidays and uh, certainly went to temple on the high holidays. Uh, but at the same time, my mother did make me ham and cheese sandwiches. And uh, we always wanted Santa Claus to come to our house. So mm-hmm. we celebrated both Hanukkah and, and, and Santa Claus. I wouldn't say we <laughs> celebrated Christmas, but the stockings were hung and we did get full stockings um so probably not atypical of what um my relatives and my neighbors were like Mm -hmm. we were not an orthodox community um so moving forward a bit you said you went to brandeis went to brandeis my brother had gone in 1949, which was the second year of its existence. It started in 48. So he was in the second graduating class. 
Uh, I went in 53, so I was in the fifth class. Um, and um, met my wife uh, there. She was a year behind me. Um, we dated throughout her time, and then uh, I graduated in 57. She graduated in 58. And as we did in those days, when you both had graduated, you got married. So we got married in 1958. Okay. I went to Harvard to graduate school in chemistry. Mm -hmm. And um, had my, wife, uh, <laughs> my wife had majored in psychology, but you weren't going to get much of a job in psychology. Mm -hmm. So she ended up um, going to secretarial school at Harvard over the summer, had some secretarial uh, training and then uh, also got an education license degree, did some student teaching. Brandeis didn't have a school of education and got a teaching job in Waltham where Brandeis is located and as she would always say after that she got her PhD degree, putting hubby through. So, <laughs> oh, that's great. so uh, yeah, so we uh, I, I graduated from uh, from Harvard in '61. I had uh, I was four years in the graduate school. Okay. And what is your wife's maiden name? Thurman. T H U R M A N. She came out of Brookline, in Mass, uh, which was probably similar in the Boston area to Borough Park in the New York area. In fact, there's a section in. Boston called Dorchester, which was quite analogous really to Williamsburg in New York. Again, immigrants started in Dorchester and then they moved up to Brookline and then from Brookline they went to Newton. And uh, Newton was sort of the high end, I guess would be our Queens. And then after that, I'm not sure where they went, but <laughs> probably to the suburbs. It's a general progression. Yeah, right. All right, so you finished in 61. I, I finished in 61. <laughs> um, had a postdoctoral year in Zurich, Switzerland um, at the Swiss Federal Institute with someone who went on to win the Nobel Prize, very excellent organic chemist who was at that time just developing the field of what is now called bioorganic chemistry where is basically the the interface between biological chemi biochemistry and organic chemistry. Um, that year, the most unusual part of it was we were driving in Spain on a vacation on a two-lane road from southern Spain. My wife was driving. I believe fell asleep at the wheel. It was early morning. And we ended up having a head-on collision with a truck. And uh, fortunately, we were in a Peugeot 404, which in those days, in 1962, had crossed the chest seat belts when America did not yet have those. I had the belt printed on my body right through the clothing. She unfortunately broke her knee cut up her nose, but really the knee was the major consequence mm. and it haunted her with arthritis for the rest of her life, really. So we went to a hospital in Zurich and eventually came back to the United States uh, in 62. I had a, another postdoctoral appointment in Madison, Wisconsin. She spent pretty much that year in the hospital in Boston, having surgeries on her knee, recovering, whatever. And um, then in 63, um, we had an offer, I had an offer to come to Purdue with an assistant professor. So we looked on the map to find Indiana. And once, once we found the state, then we could locate Lafayette. And Getting back to the whole point of this interview, I would say had there not been a temple, we wouldn't have come. I mean, the, it was very important to us 
that there was a Jewish entity uh, here in Lafayette. Uh, we had both been raised conservative. The shul had no rabbi at that time. Uh, it was a conservative shul here, in, as you may know. Are you aware of that? Um, yes, I have not okay. been by it myself, but I do know that it yeah. exists here. At one time, it was comparable in size to the Reformed Temple. Okay. Um, but um, it, at the time, had no rabbi. The rabbi here had been at Brandeis and actually was a classmate of mine. Oh. So we joined the Reformed Temple, which was the first experience either of us had yeah. with Reformed Judaism. Uh, and have m remained members of Temple Israel since that time. Who was the rabbi at that time? I think his name was Steve Weisberg. Okay, Steve Weisberg. And very interesting. Was it still um, the temple in downtown Lafayette at that point? Yes, the new building. The new, the new building wasn't built until many years later. Uh, I can't recall exactly what year it was built. I'm sure you can get that information. But at the time, the land north of the Sagamore Parkway, or as it was called, north of the bypass, was mainly farmland, very little built up, and uh, some of the main sort of uh, figures in, temple, in the temple questioned why we wanted to move that far away, <laughs> north of the bypass, as if we were going to Alaska yeah. or something, you know. Um, but yeah, yeah, we uh, were in the old the old building uh, for a number of years before. I think I think we were built in the seventies, but I, I don't recall the year. I, I believe that's right. Yeah. Sometime in the early seventies. Yeah. Um, so that's that is an important question that I have here: is that um, it mattered to you having a Jewish community moving to? For Purdue. sure. Yeah, my wife. Uh, she was pregnant. Uh, we we knew it was going to be a boy. Uh, we wanted to have a bris. Um, turned out that the ultimate, eventual Nobel Prize winner, H.C. Uh, Brown, was also a Kohen. And so we did a, uh, uh, what is it called? Um, when you buy your firstborn son back, from the priesthood, and it has to be a member of the priestly class. Um, uh, Pinya Ben. Pinya, Pinya Ben, Pinya Ben. Uh, in any event, there is this ceremony when your firstborn son, uh, which you may not be aware of. I was not all that aware of it, but, uh, but I knew it existed. Uh, so we not only had a bris, but we also had a pinya ben mm -hmm. and brought Howard back. So, mm -hmm. so he, he, uh, he stayed out of the priestly class and went to medical school instead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now he's a doctor. Yeah. So yeah, that was our introduction. There was Hillel here and there was the shul. Um, I was not much involved with Hillel. Uh, I was certainly aware of it. Uh, we knew people in the shul. There was a Lafayette Community Religious School, which still exists. But in our day, uh, there was a board of directors of that school, which was made up of three parties, membership uh, representatives from the temple, representatives from the shul, and representatives from a very well-organized group called the non-affiliates. And the non-affiliated Jews were as organized as we were, but they refused to affiliate with either congregation. And yet they wanted a voice in the Jewish education of the kids. And so they were one third of the board of directors of the Lafayette Community Religious School, as was a third from each of the two congregations. And ultimately, some of those uh, immigrated to Israel. They were, Zionists, uh, and some of them joined one or the other of the congregations, and eventually that group, uh, as an organized entity, to my knowledge, has disappeared. I don't believe there is any such organized entity, and hasn't been for a long time now.
a long time, like 20 years? Yeah, okay. yeah, I mean, probably 20, 30 years. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you came to Purdue. Um, came to Purdue. Did you... I guess, what did you feel like it was an important aspect of your job at Purdue that you had a Jewish background? Were there other Jewish faculty, or was that something that was not really addressed? Well, there were Jewish faculty here in chemistry. Um, it was interesting that, um, that they were here because uh, one of them, uh, a professor named Nathan Kornblum, who had preceded my, by some years, he was already a tenured professor, full professor, um, came out of City College in New York and told me that Purdue was the only place that offered him a faculty appointment. I mean, the anti-Semitic uh, sort of restriction on getting jobs mm -hmm. as Jewish faculty was pretty well established even in my time in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. I interviewed out in Ames, Iowa, and I remember the department had saying, why would a, a guy from New York City want to come to Ames, Iowa? And in my head, New York City was, why does anybody Jewish want to come mm -hmm. to Ames, Iowa? I, didn't, yeah. I thought I was hearing a sort of a translation of that. Yeah. Uh, I did not get an offer from Ames, Iowa. Uh, being Jewish, though, in the Department of Chemistry didn't mean anything special to me. Uh, I was just aware that the department certainly had some fairly, including this ultimately Nobel Prize winner, H.C. Brown, who, as I mentioned, was a Kohen, mm -hmm. um, had several Jewish faculty at the time I came. So it was clear that being Jewish was not a, a negative issue here. Mm -hmm. um, there were at least, at least four, uh, one of whose widow was still living. He, Joe Walensky, just passed away over at Westminster, uh, but his wife is still there. Um, but there was a man named Henry Foyer, there was Nathan Kornblum, there was H.C. Brown. I'm not sure if I'm forgetting anybody else, um, but certainly, and, uh, and the Joe Walensky. Uh, these were all tenured faculty, full professors or associate professors. And so, being Jewish in my time, would have been more of a concern than, than anything else in terms of, am I going to be treated and evaluated on my merits or will mm -hmm. being Jewish affect me in some way? And knowing who was here, it was clear to me that that wasn't going to be a problem. And I would have to compete like anybody else yeah. to be tenured, but I never gave it a second thought as to that I was Jewish or not. It was clear that that, that wasn't an issue. Yeah, yeah. That they would value, value your yeah. merit. Um, so moving to talk about the experience of the community a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that your wife was pregnant when you first moved here. Yeah. Um, how did you guys approach, um, how many children do you have? Three boys. Three boys. Mm -hmm. um, so were they all three born and raised here? Mm-hmm. So can you talk a little bit about your experience of raising children here, how involved in various community things you were? Um, if it was just Jewish community, did you expand out into other? If it was just one? Uh, like just mainly involved in the Jewish community or did you kind of integrate Oh no, with I, I um, well, I wasn't, I mean, if you're an assistant professor, you don't, <laughs> you don't do a lot of other stuff. Um, mm -hmm. My wife was, she did not, she worked part-time off and on during our time here. Uh, she was probably most heavily involved with the temple, the sisterhood at the temple. I was president of the temple twice. I was on, I'd been on the board for a number of years and served previously on the board for a number of years. Mm -hmm. So I guess my most organizational involvement would have been with the temple. Uh, in her case, I guess that's probably true as well. I don't, other than the part-time job stuff, 
I don't remember her getting very involved with any other organizations in town. So yeah, I guess uh, we were involved mostly with the Jewish community. Um, the boys went to Cumberland School and, and uh, the junior high and uh, Lafayette, West Lafayette High School. Uh, the oldest one played baseball for a couple of years with the high school. Um, all three really enjoyed the sabbatical leaves. Mm. Uh, that gave them a chance to live abroad. I, my first sabbatical was actually in Israel, at Rehovot, uh, at the Weizmann Institute. And then my second was in um, Oxford, England. And then my third was the probably the most different culture uh, relative to Zurich and uh, Rehovot and Oxford, and that was Berkeley. Oh. <laughs> at that right. point, at that point, only my youngest son was uh, was still in high school. And when we drove up to Berkeley High School, there were girls pushing baby carriages around on the parking lot. Mm -hmm. And my son, having grown up in West Lafayette, Indiana, mm -hmm. a fairly conservative area, looked at me and says, Dad, what's going on here? <laughs> and I said, Welcome to Berkeley. <laughs> oh, uh, so that was probably that was probably the biggest culture shock he was he experienced. Yeah. Anyway, um, the boys, uh, Daniel, the youngest one, played football for the high school. Was a very good running back and actually recruited by Harvard as a football player. He was a merit scholar, mm -hmm. but spent a year at Harvard. Um, the middle son played soccer. Uh, that was that was what he enjoyed, mm -hmm. and the oldest one played baseball. They all were good students. Uh, two of the three were well. Actually, I'm not sure that Howard was a merit scholar. I think Daniel was maybe the only one of the three that was a merit scholar. But they all were academically high performers. Yeah. And um, your oldest still lives in the Indy area. So Howard, uh, yeah, he. Uh, he ended up going to IU Medical School, mm -hmm. and uh, he met eventually, um, uh, he went to IU, and then he went to IU Medical School. He met at IU his wife, Jane, whose family is fairly well established in Indianapolis, very heavily involved with Bethel Zedek, uh, maiden name Gabovich, and there's a lot of Gabovichs floating around mm -hmm. in Indianapolis. Um, fairly uh, Jewish conscious family, mm -hmm. um, president of Bethel Zedek, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and they've settled in Indianapolis and uh, have been there ever since they, they married. Um, David and Daniel, well, David went also to IU, uh, met his, so they were all three members of Sammy and uh, met, I think, their wives, all three from Jewish sororities. Mm -hmm. And um, so David met his ultimate wife there as well. Um, went to law school uh, after IU and he's practicing law in Chicago and lives in Deerfield, north of Chicago. Daniel was recruited to Harvard, spent that one year as a football player, decided he really didn't like Harvard. Mm. And much to my wife's chagrin, who had always dreamed of her son going to Harvard, uh, told us he wanted to come back, and he did, and went to IU. Uh, eventually, he went to law school. Uh, he has said met his wife also at IU. Mm. Um, is now an attorney. Again, he lives um, in Northbrook, which is north of Chicago. Right. So, all three boys uh, are in the area, so to speak, which yeah. means I, I can see uh, both sets of, all well, three sets of children uh, different times. Um, there are eight grandchildren. Um, at the moment, five of them are in college 
and three have graduated from college. All right. That's really great. They've all stayed in academia yeah, and stayed well, relatively close all, to you. Yeah. You know, um, interesting that if you live in Indiana, well, I'm sure it would be true no matter where you live, but if you're at the university, you run into certainly people who have been less privileged or uh, come from families. I'm not talking about Jews necessarily here at all, actually, typically not. Yeah. Um, but who, you know, grew up where the girls were not expected to go to college, secretaries who were never allowed to go to college. Yeah. Um, and you certainly see, I think, more so than I would have seen if I had stayed in New York, for example, um, the difference between a Jewish family, the respect for education, there's never any question of sending daughters to college, mm -hmm. uh, whatever the motivation might have been, and I suspect a lot of it was to meet a husband, but that's mm -hmm. neither here nor there <laughs> in those days. It was, we're not necessarily expected to become professionals, but I have just been looking at some of the alumni stuff from Brandeis, and uh, a lot of the female graduates from Brandeis went on and made some serious uh, advances, and so Brandeis had some highly intellectual female students. Uh, but I was just in Florida, we own a home down there, which I purchased because Harriet was handicapped and uh, spending winters down there made a lot of sense once, especially once I retired. Mm -hmm. And I uh, just recently was at a little pool party and I spent much of the time with an Italian woman whose husband just passed away. And she was telling me the same thing. I mean, she never went to college. Mm -hmm. uh, it just was never expected to do that. Yeah. And very bright woman obviously knows a lot about investing and so on, but it's all, you know, non-college mm -hmm. trained or educated. It's an interesting observation how that... Yeah, I, I think in the Midwest, um, I guess I'm guessing, you know, maybe this is a little bit of prejudice coming through, I don't know, but <laughs> I think here, uh, where the Jews are such a small minority, um, you, I think you do see more examples of, of the difference between what a Jewish family's attitude towards education is and, and what was so commonplace in this area. Yeah. Um, where, you know, where you do see a very analogous perspective is with Chinese. I believe the Chinese traditions, respect for education, and so on, over the years has come closest to the way Jews think yeah. of any group that I can think of yeah. other than, you know, us. Yeah, I, I can see that. Had an interesting experience. Uh, we, a professor from Berkeley came to give a seminar and somehow in conversation, we discovered that he was a distant relative, or maybe his wife was, of one of my wife's family. And he had a daughter who had married, he was Jewish, and had a daughter who had married a Jew in Spain. And, or I'm not sure that they were in Spain when they got married, but they were living in Spain now. They were down in, I think it's Cordova, um, and we were, when we were visiting in Spain, when we had that accident, we visited with them. They were only the only Jewish couple in the city that they lived in. I think it was Cordova. Maimonides, Maimonides was Cordova, I think. I'm not sure. I'm not um, but we should we should check. But anyway, um, he, the husband could trace his family back to the expulsion from Spain. Wow. Yeah, in, in the late 1400s. Yeah. And, and they were this Jewish couple who had decided to go back and live in Spain. Mm -hmm. And I believe it 
it's Cordova or we check, but Maimonides Temple was in that city and um, not far from where they lived. And they had a son and they wanted to have a bar mitzvah. Mm -hmm. And they really wanted it in Maimonides' temple. Mm -hmm. But the Spanish government had declared Maimonides' temple to be a cultural heritage and no religious observances were allowed in it. Hmm. So they had a concert. They sponsored a concert in Maimonides Temple. Their concert leader was a cantor from, <laughs> from Madrid. <laughs> and they had a bar mitzvah <laughs> in Maimonides Temple, which was quote unquote a concert. A concert. And uh, oh, that, was really, that was really fun. <laughs> Um, uh, just an interesting uh, tidbit. Yeah, definitely. So what else? Um, can you tell me more about when you were president of the temple? I was president twice, actually. Once in the normal scheme of things. Um, been on the board. And it just became my time. Nothing special um, at that time. And then the second time... Um, we had a physician in town whose wife was president and he, for whatever reason, he was a cardiologist, needed to leave and they moved, I think it was to Kentucky. Uh, he had a no, a no, what's it called? Um, Sometimes, I'm sorry, at my age, you bark on terms. Um, when you sign a contract that you will not compete, a no-compete clause, yeah, okay. in his contract, it was at Arnett Clinic. By the way, just as an aside, so when we came here, there wasn't a single Jewish doctor in this city, really? except for one who was sort of a Purdue doctor, and some of us used him mm -hmm. in town. That was pretty impressive when you consider we had, for example, Catholic friends in McHenry, Illinois, which had very few Jews, mm -hmm. but the Jews that were there were the physicians. Yeah. And how come Lafayette had no Jewish doctors? Well, turned out, as we discovered, the Arnett Clinic wouldn't hire Jewish doctors. And, um, Eventually, a man named Josh Kaplan uh, came, and he was the first Jewish doctor. I don't think he realized that he was the first yeah. Jewish doctor to be hired at the Arnett Clinic. And of course, that's long, hist long ago history, but uh, it was very obvious at the time that Arnett had no Jewish physicians. Wow. Um, so that was the 1960s, and then do you know uh, Josh, when did Josh come? He was a plastic surgeon, I would guess maybe in the 80s. Uh, he's, I mean, he just, he and his wife just, they lived here until recently. They have a second home in Naples, and they just sold a house, actually. But uh, they were members of the temple. Mm -hmm. They're reachable, uh, if you wanted to talk to them. Yeah, and that's Kaplan, K-A-P-L-A-N. Josh Kaplan, K-A-P-L-A-N. Okay. Um, so the second time I was president is kind of funny. So the, the woman who, yeah, tell me when your time is up here. Oh. The woman who uh, was president had to leave because her husband was leaving. And she, there was no obvious president. Maybe there was no vice president at the time. And so she called my wife and told her she had to get me to accept as president. And I said, no way, I've been president, I've been there, done that. <laughs> and she kept beating on me, my wife kept beating on me, beating, you gotta do it, you gotta do it. And we were driving to Indianapolis and I said, okay, okay, I give up, I'll do it. She immediately picked up her cell phone and called this woman, said, he said yes, he said yes. <laughs> and it turned out that she had just started the idea of some sort of remodeling of the temple. Okay. And I picked that up and um, 
eventually we did a major million dollar project to expand the temple to what you see now mm -hmm. uh, with a large social hall, uh, multi, we call it the multi-purpose room. The whole Sunday school wing was rebuilt. Okay. Um, some other things were done. Uh, but that was probably the most important thing during that term of office, really, yeah, the was getting that building, getting the funding, fundraising done, and getting the building built. Okay. Very interesting. Um, one more question about, yeah. since you've been living in this community quite a while, have you noticed much change in like the, the composition of the congregation? Because like your kids have moved away, are there new families moving in? Um, what we're experiencing here, I think is pretty general from everything I've been told. Uh, people are not affiliating the way they used to. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a little less than 100 families, members of the temple at the time we came, but there was a substantial membership in the shul. I don't think it was ever as big as us, but certainly 70 or 80 families. During my stay here, my wife was uh, financial secretary. Uh, at the maximum, we hit like 135 families. Mm -hmm. We're back down to 100. Okay. So we're at the same size we were in 1963, mm -hmm. which uh, says something. Yeah. The shul has no rabbi. Uh, I don't know what its current membership is, but I'm guessing in the 30s. Mm -hmm. uh, they happen to have members who are quite well educated in in services and and i think they do lead their own services okay. uh, they do have services i'm sure um but that's what's happened to the jewish community mm -hmm. now what's happened in terms of the total number of jews in the community it's hard for me to believe that with the you know purdue had fifteen thousand students when we came mm -hmm. They're hitting 50 now. Yeah. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that there hasn't been an increase in the number of adult Jews in this community over that time period. Uh, I don't know what that number is. Uh, typically, we would look at the Federated Jewish Charities list of donors, which would give you a better picture of the whole Jewish community mm -hmm. because many people who donate to the Federation aren't members of either congregation, so you get a, a more complete picture yeah. from that list. Mm -hmm. um, it would be interesting to see what that number looks like. I don't know it. Mm -hmm. I just have to think that there are a lot more non-affiliated. There are even in my own chemistry department. Mm -hmm. I know several Jewish faculty, young Jewish faculty, who have not affiliated. and. Uh, I mean, one came up and just the other day in a meeting and said, Hak Sameach, you know, bef during the holidays, but to my knowledge, he's not, you know, I know he's not a member of our congregation, and yeah. I suspect he's not, I don't know for sure, a member of the other one either. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we, we have a, we have like anybody else, a turnover and, and young members, but we have a leadership crisis. Um, the typical age of people who are willing and able to take on leadership roles would be in the late 40s, 50s, typically. Um, our president is Brad Cohen from Arnie's Restaurant, and Brad is already in his third year of a two-year term, and we still haven't found anybody to follow him. There's no vice president. Uh, we're struggling to find somebody willing to take over the leadership. Yeah. And the obvious people would be, as I said, other people in that same age group. And yeah. for whatever reason, they're just not, nobody's willing to step forward. And we've had plenty of women presidents as well as men. This has nothing to do with gender at all. I mean, yeah. could be from either male or female members still not getting yeah. um, leadership. And, and, you know, I don't know, I don't want to sound uh, gender biased, but if you, we had a Zoom meeting, I just noticed the other day, we had a Zoom meeting of the board of directors, 
I don't know, maybe there were three guys on that meeting and maybe eight or nine women. Um, I don't see men stepping up and taking even the leadership roles that you would expect within the board, never mind at the officer level. And you can tell me what you think, but I just wonder whether women are more hesitant to take on the the role of president, you know, whether, oh, yeah. for whatever reason, you know, uh, whether that's not a level of responsibility they're inclined to take, whether there's any connection between the two, or lack of, or lack of, of being able to find leadership at the president level, and the fact that men have disappeared from, as far as I can tell, leadership roles within the temple. What do you think? You think they could be connected or not? I think it certainly sounds like a correlation. Yeah. That's just something to take into consideration as I keep talking to people, see what, see what everyone's saying about Yeah, that. I, I mean, I, again, you know, it sounds sexist, but... Um, I mean, it's just something you're observing. I don't yeah, think that's... I mean, uh, the, the, whether there's correlation or not is the question, right? I'm a scientist. Yeah. I observe this and I observe that. The real question is, you know, does smoking cause cancer or not, right? You know, it's <laughs> it's uh, definitely obvious to me. I, yeah. I looked at that Zoom screen and I saw just maybe, well, there's Brad. And there's another guy who's sort of in charge of building maintenance and a member, mm -hmm. myself. I don't remember seeing another male on that call. So, anyway. It's really interesting. Now, as you're talking, I'm thinking of the list of names that, like, I'm that, interviewing that for this. Lou gave you? Yeah, and you're the only man on the list. Uh, it's a bunch, a bunch of women's names that are yeah. all... Very interesting. I mean, the woman who, Diane Brodell, her husband was George, the cardiologist that had to leave the community. Mm -hmm. You know, she was president. There's a, a woman, um, Beth Goodman, who Lou probably maybe has or hasn't given you the name. Uh, but Beth came here with her partner from California some years ago, just picked Lafayette out of the hat. It might be interesting to talk to her about why they chose Lafayette to come to. They, they had no connection with us at all. Right. And they just did a study and decided to come here. To come here. And she's been Goodman. president twice, uh, very much involved okay. with the temple. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I have to say that if you looked at the past presidents, uh, Mike Bauer was president. He's uh, his family owns the Subway franchise here in town. Um, so there's a male. But I think I think if we look back over the presidents over the last 15 years, you'd probably find a lot more women than men. I'm trying to think of who, even who well the men have been who were president recently. Not, you know, 30 years ago, but recently. Anyway, it, it is a problem for, for Jewish organizations, I believe, to get, and, and I think you're hearing it generally for church, religious organizations, mm -hmm. and maybe even more generally for charitable organizations. I'm not sure that these generations, these last com couple of generations are joiners mm -hmm. as they might have been in my day or even more recently in my, my day. I mean, that's just social observation. I, I'm sure you'd find it out there. I've read about it. This is not, these last few generations are not typically joiner generations. Mm -hmm. My middle son, David, has gotten very active in his congregation up there in Deerfield. He's on the board. He's in charge of membership. <laughs> he organized an own Shabbat. He had just gone on a tour in Kentucky of bourbon distilleries, yeah. like, like they do in Napa with wineries. Uh -huh. Well, they apparently do it in Kentucky bourbon with in bourbon. Kentucky. And he's heavily into bourbon. All of a sudden, wine is here. He's back into bourbon. <laughs> so he organizes an Onik Shabbat with bourbon tasting. 
they had 100 people come out for, that, they did. for that service. <laughs> you advertise That's bourbon, what, they're there. Right. <laughs> uh, he'll be president of that congregation. I can see it. You know, it's just a question of when. But, yeah. but it's obvious they're going to seize on him. Uh, but David was born in 68, so what is he, 30, 53. He's right there. Right you know, at the age. In that age, yeah. Mm. That's nice to hear of one person that's mm. still involved. Yeah, the, the, though he's the only one that's really heavily involved, but all three have, have always belonged yeah. to a congregation. Sense of community yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we, raised, we raised the kids as, as a member of the Jewish community. They always were well aware of their Jewish heritage. Mm -hmm. They all went to Sunday school. Bar Mitzvah confirmed. My wife had never been bat mitzvah. They didn't do it in the conservative synagogue in Brookline that she, her family belonged to. So she took bat mitzvah lessons when Daniel did, mm -hmm. and they were bat mitzvah together oh, that's simultaneously. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Was, it's not the first person I've heard that's done that, but yeah, she did that. That's great. What else? You have given me so much information. Okay, good. Thank you. Work on it. Really appreciate um, your help with this project. You're welcome. And it's all part of preserving the all the Jewish culture we yeah. can around here.